Good morning. You can take a seat. My name is Kylie Joe, or KJ for those of you kids, and I'm the FBC Kids Director here. I get the privilege of reading the scripture this morning. Um, it is Psalm 109, verses 1 through 8. I'm not sure why he picked this psalm for me, but it's very emotive. <laughs> Be not silent, O God of my praise. For wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. So they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. Appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. And when he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few. May another take his office. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks, Kylie Joe. Good morning. My name is Greg, and I'm inviting up with me Jesse Blair and his wife Carly and two of his boys. And uh, how are you guys doing? Good. Good. Is this on? Nope. It's on? Yeah. Oh, okay. I told him not to turn it on. (laughs) (laughs) It's terrible. I am uh, really excited to be able to let you know that Jesse Blair is going to be joining the staff at FBC Medford as our pastor of student ministries starting August 1st, which is Tuesday. So uh, I wanted to introduce to you Jesse and Carly and two of his uh, sons. One of his sons is... uh, well, not here. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's all we can say about that. Uh, so a couple of questions. I just, just kind of get to know you a little bit. And I haven't told Jesse what these questions are. So what is the square root? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Where are you from? And what is your background in terms of getting into student ministry? So I grew up in Altura. So if you guys know where Klamath Falls is, if you take a little trip down the road to nowhere, into California, that's where Altura is. It's 40 minutes from Nevada and 40 minutes from Oregon. So more cows than people. That's where I grew up. And I uh, got saved after, uh, before we got married and then decided that I wanted to follow Christ with my life and do something for him and went to Bible college and then after many years graduated and ended up on staff in Altura and then to Lincoln City where we spent some time there. Okay. I mean, for most of the people in this church, you're going to know Alturas as the turnoff that you see on your way to Reno. That's where <laughs> most of these folks are on their way to Reno. Like, do people go that way? I didn't, yeah. Uh, so next time you're driving to Reno, I'm sure some of you, who goes to Reno? Everybody <laughs> does. They, they're not going to admit it. Tell us something. You're, I mean, you're starting student ministry here at FBC, but you've done it for many, many years before. What is it that you look forward to the most when it comes to student ministry? What is the thing that really kind of gets you motivated? So for me, I really want to see uh, students go from, uh, you know, growing in the Lord to actually serving their whole life, uh, a lifelong, like, discipleship program, like, where they're serving with their whole life. That's, that's what gets me excited. It's not the momentary thing. It's the lifelong following of Christ. Okay, cool. And um, last question. This is probably the hardest one. This is a philosophy of ministry question. A lot of people here are wondering, and so I felt like it's my job to ask it. <laughs> Say, for example, you've scheduled yourself to conduct a wedding, and then it turns out that a buddy of yours has drawn into, say, mule deer season in Utah or bighorn sheep (laughs) in Montana, and and you have to choose between going on this great hunt or doing the wedding. What does that decision look like for you? Am I the only person that can do the wedding? (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) So, okay, I just... No, I... (laughs) <laughs> okay, I just, that, I mean, that's a fair question. The second question is, why are they scheduling a wedding during hunting season? That would season? be my is first that, question. Okay, um, okay just, so. that's fair. Okay, good. Well, so I, would, I want to encourage all of you, if you uh, haven't had a chance to meet Jesse and his wife, be sure to touch base with them, especially if you are a student or have uh, students uh, in student ministry. Jesse would look forward to uh, meeting you today or in the near future. So uh, why don't I pray for you guys for student ministry and then we'll go. God, we thank you for your grace on this church that you have brought Jesse and his family here. We are grateful uh, for the opportunity you've provided for you to use their gifts and uh, skills and the work that you've done in their lives to impact uh, students for the kingdom of God. And we pray that you would bless, that our heart's desire would be students would know Jesus 
and that they would learn over the course of their time in the student ministry here at FBC what it looks like to be a part and serve his kingdom for their whole lives. And so, God, we pray your blessing and grace uh, on the ministry to students we have here at this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Why don't we thank them for being here with us? All right. All right, good morning, and we're in Psalm 109. Psalm 109. I don't have a good transition from that to this. So Psalm 109. Question probably many of us have asked. If you haven't asked this question of yourself you will, or of God at some point already, you will some point in the future. But I'm certain many of us have, have asked this question before. When you are, are praying and seeking the Lord about something in particular, have you ever wondered... Does God even hear me? Have you ever, as you're praying and seeking the Lord, you're praying about something, and maybe it's something fairly pressing. Uh, you're saying, does God even hear? Does he even respond? Is anything going on? Um, and, and what's happening here? And, and if you've had that question, if you've asked that question, which I imagine anybody who's known the Lord longer than five minutes, you've asked that question because something important is happening in your life and you're seeking the Lord and his intervention and you wonder if anything is going on, the, the answer is provided by this psalm. And what I love about this psalm is it answers very clearly, God does hear. However, the psalmist here, King David, doesn't sort of gloss over the reality of how stressful that is. You know, sometimes you ask somebody, you say, well, I've been praying about something and, and, um, and, and I don't know if anything's happening. And somebody might answer very politely and kindly, well, God hears you. And, we, and, and our response is, well, thank you, that's true. I, but that does, I feel like something more is going on. David, as he answers this question, he enters in with us in that tension of, I know God hears, but boy, it sure doesn't feel like it. I know he's there, but, but man, I'm not sure what's going on. And, and so as we go through the psalm, we're going to discover what it's like to seek the Lord and wonder if anything's going on. And then secondly, we're going to discover how that works out over time. And that's really, really important because we want to keep praying to the Lord even when we wonder what's going on. So the title of the message is God Doesn't Stay Silent. And we're going to look at two scenarios. Number one, in the first part of this psalm, we're going to understand God doesn't stay silent when we've experienced deep hurt, when we've been deeply hurt. And God doesn't stay silent because he, we know, and we're going to see this in the second part of the psalm, we know that we are completely saved by him. God doesn't stay silent when we're deeply hurt, and God doesn't stay silent because we're completely saved. So stick with me on this, and uh, we'll try to get through this in a, in a timely manner. And some of you are saying, oh, well, Greg needs to work his way through the psalm relatively quickly because there are children here. And so, no, it's because there are men here. Um, <laughs> you got to get through this in 20 minutes otherwise. I mean, we've already lost most of the guys. We talked about hunting. And uh, got some guys on their phone. Now, how do I get into mule deer? Okay. God doesn't stay hurt when we're, uh, God doesn't stay silent when we're deeply hurt. Look with me again at the beginning of this song. Kylie Jo read it, and it's an a, a important verse. Verse 1, be not silent, O God of my praise. For wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. So this is a person who has been hurt, but not merely uh, have, with his enemies. This is a person who has been betrayed. And betrayal is such a significant uh, part of the human experience, whether we like it or not. But it's such a significant hurt that we experience that it is, it's something that often shows up in, in, in dramatic performances. There's two really, really important betrayals in the arts that we can think of. One is in classical literature, a guy named William Shakespeare, or Bill. He told me I can call him Bill. <laughs> he wrote a, a play called Julius Caesar, talking in, in, in a, a performance of the life of Julius Caesar. And of course, Julius Caesar is assassinated by uh, senators, and as they are executing the assassination of Julius Caesar, he looks and sees his close friend, and he utters that phrase, which everybody knows. What is it? Et tu, Brute. Yeah, so he's, and this is that betrayal. As his dying, his dying sight is realizing that his close friend was a part of the conspiracy 
to murder him. Now, some of you are like, okay, that's great. I, that's great betrayal, but that's a little bit remote. This is like BC, this is 2,000 years ago. Okay, a little bit more modern example, uh, but not too modern. Uh, this is also seen by a guy named Michael Corleone. Okay, here we go. Now we're in. <laughs> and he realizes that his brother Fredo is the one who betrayed him and nearly got him killed, and they're in Cuba. Do you remember the scene? And now you're not, yet. and some of you are like, I don't know if I'm allowed to admit I watched Godfather at church. <laughs> and he grabs Freda, I knew it was you, and he kisses him, and that kiss is not a kiss of affection, it's a kiss of death, right? He says, now I'm after you. But here is Michael Corleone, he's been betrayed by his very own brother. And you, if you've seen that film, if you haven't seen the film, well, at least watch that scene on YouTube. It's expertly performed because you can see the pain in Marco, Michael Corleone. It's the betrayal by those we love is one of the most painful things we can experience. And this is the pain that is being experienced by King David in Psalm 109. Betrayal by someone who was close and someone who cares, someone he thought was, it, what, it was on the inner circle has now stabbed him in the back. And what we can understand is when we're betrayed, it's tempting to think that God is absent or God is silent because the pain is so significant. And what the psalm is going to show us is that God is still present and God is still active. And what we're going to find out as we look at this psalm is this anticipates the betrayal of Jesus. And we can see how God responded to Jesus during his time of betrayal to really understand how God is active during our hardest of times, most difficult of times. Verses 1 through 5 of Psalm 109, as Kylie Joe read, this is an appeal to God. Notice, look again at verse 1. Be silent, O God, of my praise. This is someone who is coming to God, someone who worships God. So David's perspective is not, if God responds in the right way, I will worship him. What he is saying is, this is the God I worship, and I will pursue him with honesty. So he is coming, he said, this is the God I worship. And why does David worship God? Because he is the one true God. What choice does he have? That's his understanding. I'm going to worship the one true God, the God that I praise, the God that ought to be worshipped. I'm going to ask this God not to be silent. And David is extraordinarily honest about what's going on in his life. He says, I am suffering and I ought not to be suffering because somebody has wronged me. I am suffering and I shouldn't be. Somebody has committed a sin and that sin is against me. So I'm experiencing emotional pain, maybe physical pain if somebody has been assaulted. This is, this is someone who is suffering wrongly. More than that, this is someone who is suffering wrongly at the hands of someone they care deeply for. They didn't know it was coming. They didn't know it was coming. This is not someone who merely rejects him. This is not, not someone who merely treats him with coolness or distance. This is betrayal. This is someone who goes from caring deeply to seeking the, uh, the greatest harm possible to David the individual. This is a, someone we might even say who uses the closeness of the relationship to cause the greatest damage possible. And David is going to the Lord as the one he worships. Where else would he turn? Where else would he turn in this kind of a situation? Look how he describes these people who are coming after him. Verse 3, they encircle me with words of hate. Anybody ever heard that phrase? Uh, Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will what? That's been a lie since the day it was written, hasn't it? How many of you, after the words have been spoken, would say, I would gladly take the sticks and stones? Because those wounds will heal with time. But the words, how do you forget them? There's no band-aid. There's no antiseptic. Those stick. And that's what David is saying. They encircle me. In return for my love, they accuse they reward me evil for good. So here's David serving others and they do evil for him. Loving them and they return to him hatred. Hatred. And he's seeking the Lord of his worship because he has nowhere else to turn. And his plea to God is, God, do not be silent. Do not be silent. Now that seems kind of rude. Have you ever prayed that? Maybe you've prayed this prayer before. 
Uh, this is a rather spiritual prayer. You might want to write this down. Hey, Lord, anytime. Be great. Uh, God, are you busy? Is it, do you have other things on your mind? So, and some of us would think, oh, that's rude. You could never pray something like that. I, that's what I love about David. He gives us words. We can be honest with God about what's going on in our hearts. But notice how David balances this or he understands it. He can be honest with God, but he's not denying the reality that God ought to be worshiped. And that's where the strength to be honest with God comes from. He doesn't question God's being there or question God's power he, but he's going to be honest with God about what he's experiencing. I'm going to come to God who ought to be worshipped, but I'm going to tell God how it feels. It feels like you're not doing anything. Come on, let's, get, let's handle this, Lord. Let's look at verses 6 through 20. If any of you have ever been wronged or had somebody betray you or hurt you, I want you to write down Psalm 109, 6 through 20. Because all of the things you have thought about this person have gone too easy on them. And, and so here are some verses. If you're like, you know what, I'm just being mean. What you can do is write down these verses. Here we go. Appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. Oh, my land, this guy is mad. May his days be few. May another take his office. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Guys, do not write Psalm 109.9 in an anniversary card. <laughs> These are not appropriate for any kind of greeting card. Unless you're giving it to the one who betrayed you. May his children wander about and beg, seeking food from the ruins they inhabit. Wow, easy, buddy. May a creditor seize all that he has, and may strangers plunder the fruits of his toil. Let there be none to extend kindness to him, nor any to pity his fatherless children. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. This is a call for God to bring justice on someone who has done wrong. I love this prayer because it tells us that we can stop, even as believers who trust in the goodness of grace of God, we can stop minimizing the hurt that we've experienced. It does not, doesn't do us any good. It doesn't do the people around us any good to say, oh, it's no big deal. To David here, this betrayal is what? It's a big deal. He is not going to minimize that this person has hurt him. He is not going to minimize that he's experienced wrong and injustice in his life. He's not going to pretend like it's some kind of spiritual merit badge to pretend like it doesn't hurt to be betrayed. He's going to be honest about it. He's going to be clear about it. And this is a call for God to bring justice. So this is where we have to understand the difference between calling on God to bring justice and our seeking revenge. See, and this is what's interesting. For a lot of evils that we can do, there is a good that we can understand God doing. So if somebody does something wrong, if somebody smacks me upside the head, one of the ways, vengeance would be for me to smack them upside the head harder. That would be the way to do that. That's vengeance. But if somebody hits me, now what, I, what I'm yearning for, I'm yearning for justice. Something wrong has been done and it needs to be made right. So there's two ways to approach that. The sinful way to approach being wronged is to seek revenge. The righteous way to seek wrong is for, to get smacked, turn to the Lord and say, God, would you deal with this? I need you to handle this. That's justice. And that's what David is doing here. And he's giving God ideas on way, the ways that justice could be approached, which I love. I lo and I love this. Now, he is not telling God, these are the things that must happen. He is just explaining to God in poetic form. Look, I have been wronged. I don't have the means to make it right. Or I ought not to be the one to make it right. And so I'm going to go to the Lord and seek justice from him. Say, God, you know what has happened. You know the hurt I have experienced. You know the heart of the individual. Lord, I am going to lay that at your feet. And so he has specific hopes for this. He says, may this person experience justice from God. And that's very different than revenge. Revenge says, I can make things right. Revenge happens when I think God is slow. Revenge happens when I think God is too nice to the wrongdoer. 
Revenge happens when I don't believe in God and I think somebody has to act. And so therefore, I am going to try to make things right. And it's going to come from a, from a place of anger. And usually our revenge is greater than the wrong that was done to me. I've got to, I've got to leave a mark. Whereas God's justice is always perfect. We see this all the time in, in Acts. Uh, uh, there's always a, sort of a good and bad way of approaching things in our life. So when we've been wronged, the good way of pursu pursuing things is God's justice over our revenge. Another example of this that might be helpful is this. Maybe in your life you say, you know what? I want to put myself to work. I want to exert effort and expertise to earn a living so that therefore I can provide for the needs of my family, enjoy God's creation, and be generous. Or we can say, I will seek my satisfaction from the, the world's goods. So the two ways we understand it, one of those is greed. I will seek to be as wealthy as possible in order to satisfy my appetites. The good element and the dollar amount doesn't matter. The, the other side of it is, you know what? I want to work hard with expertise and proficiency, and I want to earn a living to provide for those around me to enjoy the creation of God as well as to be generous. But it's, it's the same thing. And so what we see here is David saying, I want something to happen in this individual's life. The right way for that to happen is if God brings justice. The wrong way for that to happen is for me to seek revenge. And so here he's calling for God to bring justice. So one of the ways you can think about this, if you have been wronged, now you may play spiritual with your friends, you may play spiritual at church, you may play spiritual on Facebook, I don't know. Oh, the Lord has it, he knows. When you go to the, when you go to the Lord, will you at least be honest there? God, they have wronged me. It hurts deeply. Will you please, God, go scorched earth on their life? <laughs> And you say, well, you shouldn't pray like that. Are you some, are you some of you arguing with me? I, I, you always do. Then what do you do with Psalm 109? What do you do with Psalm 109? If you're not going to expect justice, then what are you praying to God for? Justice must be done if God is just. And so let's be honest with the Lord. If you have been wrong, then go to the Lord and say, Lord, you take care of this. And if we follow David's example, where's Lord, you take care of this, and let me give you some ideas. Let me give you some things to keep in mind. Now, there's more to this, but I, I don't want us to go soft on this, because this is what we see in the Bible here. And you say, well, that doesn't feel right. Well, what's better, vengeance? Is that better, revenge? And some of us, well, I would never take revenge. Oh, I just thought of it. I shouldn't do stuff that isn't in my script, but usually that's the most fun. One of the best ways we do revenge nowadays, because most of us are too polite to punch people, is gossip. That's the best way to, you know, I can't really punch them in the face, and I don't really want to confront them, and I don't want to throw eggs at their car. So what I'm going to do is just sort of float things out to there to the people they know. You know, why not just destroy their reputation? So there's a good way. So that's when I can, I can take revenge by just sort of snipping at them behind their back. Or I can go to God and say, God, would you do me a favor and destroy their reputation? Because they have, they have destroyed mine. So Lord, I seek justice. So that's what we're doing. We're saying, instead of seeking revenge, instead of seeking our own satisfaction with things are wrong, I'm going to put my hope in the Lord and trust he hears when we've been deeply hurt. Verses 16 through 20, if you want, are wondering what did this individual do. Now, we're not exactly sure which individual this was in the life of David. It could be a number of people. It could be Joab. It could be Absalom. It could be the, the relative who, of Saul who uh, pelted David and his uh, soldiers with stones and dirt as they were fleeing uh, from Jerusalem. There's a number of people that uh, betrayed David during his life. We're not exactly sure who it could have been. But here's the specific wrongs that the person did. Verse 16, he did not remember to show kindness. He pursued the poor and needy. There it could have been King Saul pursuing David. He pursued the brokenhearted and put them to death. He loved to curse. Let curses come upon him. He did not delight in blessing. May it be far from him. He clothed himself with cursing as his coat. 
Make, may it soak into his body like water, like oil into his bones. May it be like a garment that he wraps around him, like a belt he puts on every day. May this be the reward of my accusers from the Lord, of those who seek evil against my life. So these are the wrongs that he has done. He has is, he is, uh, pursued to harm the weakest. So David here is making it clear in his prayer to God, I'm not overreacting. This is, David is not upset because somebody forgot to put the toilet seat down or didn't put the cap on the toothpaste or didn't trim the edges of the lawn. He's saying, no, this is a person who has committed significant wrongs. And what he wants is the wrongs that he has done to actually end up having those effects on him. That's why when you look at those verses, he's saying, may the things he did actually come back on him. He clothed himself with curses. May those curses come back on him. And that's why this is David saying, I just want justice. Justice is needed. And what he is saying here is justice is needed from God. God doesn't stay silent when we're deeply hurt. I want to connect this in with our Lord Jesus. Because the Bible does that in Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. I'm going to read it. This is what it says. <clears throat> In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was, in all, about 120. And he said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning who? Judas. Okay, now we're starting to get it. Who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Verse 18, it's about to get a little gory. Now, with, now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. That's gross. It became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so this field was called in their own language a, a keldama, that is, field of blood, that makes sense. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it. And, and here this is verse 8 of Psalm 109, the psalm we're in right now, let another take his office. And so while David's experience of betrayal was real, David's experience was significant, David's experience was was just as hurtful and, and terrible as any of us might imagine or as any of us have experienced. The reality is, David's experience was merely a foretaste of the greatest betrayal of all time. That Psalm 109 is merely a, a forward look into the betrayal that our Savior Jesus experienced at the hand of Judas. And Judas' rebellion is, a, uh, is significant because it really illustrates for us the rebellion that shows up in the heart of every single person. Look at verse 17 of Acts 1. Judas was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So what this means is Judah had a, Judas had a participation in the ministry of Jesus as a disciple. And that phrasing there is very, very interesting. He says he has a share. That's like an ownership share, a piece of the action. He was a partner in the ministry with, who is vested in and as, as a minister. But this means this partner in ministry, like all the partners in ministry, had to make a decision as to where they wanted to be vested. So verse 18 tells us where he wanted to be vested. He took his share that he had in the ministry of Jesus and traded it in for what? 30 coins. And then he purchased a field. Now he purchased the field through the priest. He had thrown the money back to the priest and the priest went and bought the field. And there he experienced remorse over what he did. And the Bible describes his death in this field that he purchased instead of participating in the share that he had in Jesus. So he traded in, he traded in his ownership share in the ministry of Jesus for a field where he would experience his own death. Now, why is this interesting? Because this reminds us of a story in the Old Testament, which is just like this. There's a guy named Naboth. Naboth owned a vineyard. Good for Naboth, cheap wine, right? 
Ahab. Okay, you're not doing it right. Come on. Ahab. Ooh. Okay, there we go. Now we're in. Okay, good. I don't want the kids to think we're boring. <laughs> that, no, two of them just said too late. Um, <laughs> Ahab wanted his vineyard. And the reason Ahab wanted his vineyard is because it was in close proximity to his palace and he wanted to plant vegetables there. I don't know either. I don't know why. You got a vineyard. So he went to Naboth and said, hey, tell you what, I want to trade you land. You give me your vineyard, I'll give you an even better piece of land, and we'll be square. And Naboth said, what? No. Why did Naboth say no? Because he's an idiot? No. Because he understood that his land was more than just property. It was a covenant promise of God that he and his family were part of the people of God. And that's what he told Ahab. How could I possibly give up this land, my, my family's land? And this is more than just generational wealth. This is how God is expressing his covenant relationship with his people. And the way Naboth expressed his faith in God was to say, I would rather have a cheap vineyard than an expensive piece of real estate that Ahab is offering. Because Ahab would have been offering him a piece of land that would have been profitable. And so what this is, Naboth is saying is, my share is in the covenant of my Lord, and I will not trade that share. I will not trade my share. So Ahab's wife, Jezebel. Ahab, they, okay, somebody got it. <laughs> somebody got it. It's all right. She did okay in the end. She fell out of a window. <laughs> Jezebel arranged for a big, big dinner for Naboth in his hometown. So Jezebel, listen, entered into a couple of guys at this dinner. And what did they do? They betrayed him. They betrayed him. They said, this guy is a devil worshiper. This guy ought to be stoned outside the city. So they picked him up and took him outside. The, does this sound familiar? Betrayed, killed outside the city. Because Ahab wanted to take his share, but he refused to take his share and trade it. He refused to simply swap it, swap it out. And this is what Judas did. Judas, just like Jezebel, just like the devil who entered into him, said, I would rather trade out my share in the ministry of Christ to seek my own ends and I would gladly reject the righteous one to seek my purposes. Here's a, one last little thing on this. There's a couple of times where the people of Israel rebel against their king. Once against King David and once against King Solomon. When David was returning for, to Jerusalem after Absalom had been killed. The tribes to the north didn't feel like they were being handled fairly. And they said, each man to his own tent. What share have you? What share have you in David? And those 10 tribes did the same thing to King Solomon's son, Rehoboam. They rebelled against him and said, to your own tent, what share have you, O Israel, in the house of David? And this is exactly what Judas said. What share do I have in Christ? I would rather trade in my share and reject the righteous one. And this is what Judas did to Jesus. Judas rejected Jesus. We can say it this way. Judas, who had a share in the ministry of Christ as a disciple, rejected Jesus to speculate on some real estate because he felt there was more value there. That's the rejection of Jesus. This is personal. This is, you are the Messiah, and I don't like the Messiah you got. You are the God, you are God, and I don't like the God I got. You are every, this isn't an expression of unbelief. This is an expression of distaste. I know who Jesus is. I know, Judas was there when he raised people from the dead. Judas was there when he healed people. Judas was there. He knew who this guy was. This was simply, I don't want him. And if you think Jesus was disaffected, that he merely was distant from it, then you're not reading Psalm 109 right, and you're not reading Acts 1 right. This tells us, these two things coming together, Acts 1, and Psalm 109 tells us what was going on inside of Jesus. What was going on? 
the same amount of hurt that you and I experience in that same moment. He knows exactly what that feels like. In fact, we might suggest that this betrayal was the greatest betrayal of all time. And regardless of the betrayal you and I have experienced, while it's significant, we know Jesus has experienced it to the utmost. Jesus has experienced it the most. Was God silent with Jesus? So that's what we have to ask. If, if God is silent during betrayal, was God silent with Jesus? And what's the answer? Of course not. Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and prayed to the Lord, God, if this cup can pass for me, great. If not, not my will, but yours be done. In the end, Jesus goes to the cross and dies to pay for the rebellion of all of us because the reality is Jesus' betrayal that he experienced at the hands of Judah is the betrayal he is experiencing from all of us. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have at some point in some level said, I'd rather have my stuff than Jesus. I'd rather have my kingdom than Jesus. So Jesus goes to the cross and pays for all of our sin. But what happened three days later? Resurrection. Was God silent? No, he wasn't. God was not silent. Because it's impossible for Jesus to stay dead. Now, just like us, we would prefer God answer our prayer a little bit closer to when we're praying. But Jesus had to wait a few days, didn't he? He had to endure a cross. He had to endure three days in the tomb. So God wasn't silent with Jesus. Jesus is raised. God isn't absent. God isn't silent. But on the other hand, God is also willing to wait for the precise, correct time for justice to be done. For us, when is that time? Right now, when is it for God at the exact right time? God doesn't say silent, even when we're deeply hurt. Okay, let's look at verses 21 through 31. Some of you are saying, how are we possibly going to get done on time? Well, we get done at two, so we'll be fine. (laughs) Psalm 109, 21 through 31, God doesn't stay silent because we're completely saved. If you don't mind, let me read the remainder of this psalm. Verses 21 through 31, you can follow along in your copy of Scripture. But you, O God, my Lord, deal on my behalf for your name's sake. Because your steadfast love is good, deliver me. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is stricken within me. I am gone like a shadow at evening. I am shaken off like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting. My body has become gaunt with no fat. I am an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they wag their heads. Help me, O Lord, my God. Save me according to your steadfast love. Let them know that this is your hand. You, O Lord, have done it. Let them curse, but you will bless. They arise and are put to shame, but your servant will be glad. May my accusers be clothed with dishonor. May they be wrapped in their own shame as in a cloak. Verse 30. With my mouth I will give great thanks to the Lord. I will praise him in the midst of the throng for he stands at the right hand of the needy one to save him from those who condemn his soul to death. This is the psalmist David praying for God's salvation knowing that God will indeed save. A film came out a while ago. It's called Castaway with Tom Hanks. It's got a lot of riveting dialogue between him and a volleyball. If you don't know the story, he's on an airplane, FedEx plane, because UPS would never crash in the ocean. I'm duty bound to say that. (laughs) Crashes and he washes up on an island. Now, back home is his girlfriend that he was hoping to propose to before he got on this ill-fated flight. He was hoping to marry this uh, woman. He crashes and ends up on the island and spends a long period of time surviving on this island and eventually is able to get off the island and be rescued on a ship. And so he flies home, and so he is saved from the island, and he gets home and discovers she's married and has a child, in fact. And if you've seen the film, and it's a really, really good film, except for the part where Wilson floats away. That's devastating. (laughs) It's the hardest part of the movie. I won't won't lie. I cried a little about that little ball, that little guy. Jeez. Jeez. He was saved, but he wasn't completely saved. The movie ends 
with him at an intersection of a barren country road, wondering what's next. And it leaves us with, okay, he made it home. And if we're optimistic, it means his life has a new future. But there's a, a bit of a, he made it home, but now he has to make the best of a bad situation. So he was saved from the island, but his life was not redeemed because he has experienced now loss that continues. God's salvation, on the other hand, is comprehensive. It's complete. He saves us from our own sin and judgment. At the same time, he brings perfect justice to the places where we have been wronged. There is no loose ends. There is no untidiness. There is no making the best of a bad situation. When God saves, he saves all the way down to the innermost. God's salvation is complete. Look at verses 21 and verses 26. Let's understand this. But you, God, my Lord, deal on my behalf for your name's sake because your, look at the word, steadfast love is good. See that word there? He's saying, deal with me for your name's sake because of your steadfast love. What are you saying? Save me, God, not because I deserve it. Pay attention. That's not what he said. He didn't save me because people were mean. Don't save me because there was a meanie. Save me because there was a big bully. Save me because I'm sad. Save me because I shouldn't have been wronged. Save me, God, because I would never do what they did. Save me, God, because I go to church a lot. Save me, God, because I give money away. Save me, God, because I don't do the swears. Save me, God, because I only drink micro-brews. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what your thing is. Why does he want saving? He stakes his salvation not on him, but on who? God. Your namesake because of your steadfast love. That steadfast love is is the word that indicates love that never, 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 never quits. Read Psalm 136. This word appears after every single verse. He says, save me because you are that kind of God. You are saved, not because of me. If God was saving David because David, David would still be lost. God, he is imploring that David saves him because he knows what God is like. You're a saving kind of God who loves nincompoops like me. That's what David is saying. He repeats it down in verse 26. Help me, O Lord, my God. Save me according to how many awards I've earned in Awana. <laughs> according to my attendance record at church. According to my, I don't speed. According to, I'm really honest in my business dealings. None of that malarkey. It's a theological word. Help me, God, because you are a loving God. That's his that's where his prayer is coming from. I know what you're like, God. You are a God whose love never quits, so I expect you to save me because you're that kind of guy. That's where he's coming from. This is David wanting justice while at the same time he acknowledges he needs God's grace. You can both want justice at the same time recognize you need God's grace. And that's what David is doing here. He's asking for God's help based on God's love, not because he deserves to be helped. David is not pitting God to choose, choose me or choose him. You can't love us both. He's saying, God, I know what you're like. You love me. Do your thing. Make things right. This is David who's saying, God, I want you to make all things right. Both the things I have done wrong as well as the person who has wronged me. What this means is each individual needs to decide who ought to pay for the wrongs you have done. So David is saying, I've done wrong. Is David, did David do anything wrong? Yeah, a few things. Uh, a few more than well-known things. He, of course, slept with Bathsheba when she was still married, then murdered her husband. I feel like that's morally in the gray area. Um, no, that's just wrong. He then uh, counted, he did a census, which was terrible. 70,000 people died. Something we often overlook is David's parenting. Uh, you know, he is not a model of fatherhood. Like if you want to be a dad, there's lots of fairly good dads in the Bible. David is not your guy. So David, what he is saying is, you know, I've done a lot of things wrong. You know what I'm going to do? I don't want to pay for the things I've done wrong. I can't afford it. God, will you pay for the things I've done wrong because you are loving? And what does God say? Yeah, 
I will. But God is also glad to let us pay for our own wrongs. So that's what David is saying. Look, if this guy wants to pay for his wrong, God, sick him. <laughs> but I don't want to pay for my wrongs. Because I can afford it. This is David saying, I want justice to be done in my life and their life. But I know because I am a sinner, I want God to bear the cost of my sin. Look at it in verses 30 through 31. With my mouth I give thanks to the Lord. I'll praise him. For he stands at the right hand of the needy one to save him from those who condemn his soul to death. This right hand is critically important. Just very, very quickly. It's mentioned a lot in Job 1 and 2. If you uh, like looking at the spiritual world, read Job 1 and 2. So you have God and you have a couple of people speaking to God. In this case, you have the devil. He comes in and tells God... Job doesn't worship you because he loves you. He worships you because you pay him. So the way, God, that you get worshipers is you buy them off. That's what the devil's accusation. He's accusing both God and Job. He's accusing Job of only worshiping because he got bought. And he's accusing God of only getting worshipers by paying them. So he's accusing them. And what does God do about Job? He says, what are you talking about? This guy's righteous. Here's, this is interesting. Is Job righteous? Ish. I don't know if you've read Job. He's got a bit of an attitude. I mean, he had a bad day, so we'll give him that. But nonetheless, not many of us argue with God the way Job did. I mean, Job was gutsy. Uh, just so you know, I self-edited there, and you're welcome. God is the one defending Job. God is defending a sinner. He's standing, making intervention against the accuser on behalf of the one who has put his faith in him. That's what God is like. He defends and intervenes on behalf of the one who trusts him in the face of the accuser. That is, when we trust God, we have an advocate. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Familiar verse. Who is to condemn? That's a question in Romans 8, 34. Who is to condemn? Who can condemn those who are in Christ? Who can condemn those who are in Christ? Are you not sure on this? You don't know how to answer that because all, the, all the, the answers are always Jesus, but it doesn't feel right in this case. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who sits at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. That's what Jesus is doing for us. That's what David is understanding at the end of the psalm, that God is interceding for me. So how this works theologically, let me just paint a real broad brush here. You get saved. Now, Jesus' job is to intercede on your behalf. Why is Jesus having to intercede for you? You're not good at being saved. Just letting that sink in a little bit. Some of you thought you were varsity. You're not. <laughs> Jesus is varsity at intervening. So then you are a Christian and you do something sinful. You know, you root for the Packers. <laughs> No, that's terrible. That's rude. You do something sinful. You get angry. You cuss. You get drunk. You look at something inappropriate online. You steal from your boss. Something wrong. It's a sin. And so then there's this throne room in, in going on. You got, got the father there, got the son standing there, and the devil comes walking in and says, Look, look what he did. And what's God say? He doesn't, no, 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 I didn't see it. No, he doesn't do that. What's Jesus say? Oh, yeah, that's terrible. But I paid for it, so we're good. That's intervention. Yeah, no, that was awful. That's sin. But that's why I died on the cross. This guy is terrible at being a Christian. And so Jesus just keeps intervening, intervening. Jesus is interceding for us. This verb is an ongoing act. And we think we're working so hard at being good Christians. Who's working harder in this relationship? Listen, he's working 24-7. This job goes on while you're sleeping. That's how rough it is on him. He's just always interceding. So who can condemn you if the risen Jesus' full-time job is to intercede on your behalf? No one can condemn you. The greatest accuser of all time, Satan himself, has made it his job to try and make you guilty, and Jesus will not have it. 
So the trick of the devil is, because he has figured out he can't convince God that you're a sinner because Jesus made you righteous. So what does he do instead? He comes to you and tells you that God doesn't love you very much. Because God could never love somebody who does what you do. So he can't convince God you're terrible. So what does he do? He tries to convince you that you are terrible. That's normal. That's what he does. But when we trust God, we have an advocate. God doesn't stay silent because when we trust him for salvation, he saves us the whole way. All the way to the end, he's going to make intercession for us. All the way to the very end, completely saves us. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 and 25. Just in case you're worried, he might get tired. Jesus holds his priesthood permanently. For those of us who have been Christians a while, we should be insulted by that. We should be thinking, well, certainly he only has to be a priest for us till we get our act together. What Hebrews 7 is telling us is we are going to need a priest. How long? The whole time. The whole time. He holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. So we have an immortal priest who never dies. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Always lives to make intercession for them. What's Jesus' full-time job for you? Making intercession. When he's on a break from that, what's he do for fun? Makes intercession. When God, Jesus goes on vacay, what's he do to, to chill out on the beach? Makes intercession. This is what he does. It is not a chore. It is not a problem. He loves it. He loves it. I, I wish we could see it, but there are times certain that you blow it. And devil comes walking in. And he says, look at what Jason did. Sorry, Jason, you're sitting right there. <laughs> and Jesus just has a stack of microphones, goes paid, drop, mic drop. Bye-bye. He loves it. And we think he is so offended by it. We, we, we're convinced that God is just, oh, oh, he blew it again. When Jesus, this is what I do. This is how I roll. I make intercession for them. When we trust Jesus, he saves us to the, look at Hebrews, the what? Uttermost. Which one of the Christians is saved to the uttermost? The ones who know lots of verses? Uttermost. The ones who have trouble reading? Uttermost. The ones who struggle in sins that aren't very polite? What is it? Uttermost. The ones who have a bit of a bad attitude, Baptist. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> uttermost. The ones who have different political views than you. Saved to the uttermost. To the uttermost. Because we're saved. Not because we're awesome. We are saved because Jesus is. How, let's wrap this up. Last place. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. We'll try to bring this all back together. This is the Apostle Paul talking about difficulty in life. So, to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for the power, my power is made perfect in weakness. Has anybody ever quoted that verse, my grace is sufficient for you? Yeah, it's a fantastic verse. One of the best verses there is. My grace sufficient for you. Normally when we apply that verse, we're thinking about sin we have committed. We ought to because that's what it means. I have committed sin and is God's grace sufficient? What's this verse say? Absolutely. But there's more going on than that here. And that's what I want us to see. Therefore, I will boast gladly in all my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ then, I am content with... Weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, I am strong. So he is taking this, this insight. My grace is sufficient for you. And he is applying it to his own sin. God's grace is sufficient for me when I am a sinner. When I sin. Also, Christ's grace is sufficient for me when, look at verse 10. When I experience insults. Also in verse 10, when I experience persecutions. So what we understand is one writer has noted, Christ's grace is sufficient for my sin, and Christ's grace is also sufficient 
to help me when I am sinned against by others. That I need God's grace to experience going through the difficulty of that betrayal. And that's what we see in Psalm 109. Is David looking forward to Christ and Christ being sufficient grace for us. So David experienced betrayal which foreshadowed the greatest betrayal of all time to Christ, so that when we experience betrayal now, we can say, I need God's grace for my sin. And God's grace is sufficient for the ways in which people have sinned against me. How is that grace sufficient? Number one, we know that there is nothing anybody can do to us that God cannot redeem. God cannot use for his purposes to make us more like Jesus. And we know Christ will make all things right in the end. There's two ways that can work out for the person who has wronged you. One of them you will like, one of them you won't. Are you ready? Number one, someone wrongs you and chooses to pay for their sin themselves. Right? So in the end, God will make all things right and perfect justice will be done. You will say, I am satisfied. God has made this wrong right. Now you like that idea. Here's the one you don't. The other option is this person may be struck by the grace of Christ. And Jesus is going to intercede on their behalf. Does that mean he washes away his sin? Yes. Does it mean justice is not done? No. Because who takes the justice for you then? Jesus does. So the wrong I have experienced, the penalty for that is going to go somewhere because God is always just. It is either going to go on the individual if they choose to bear their own sin, which would be terrible, or Jesus is going to bear the cost of that, but you will be made right in the end. God doesn't stay silent, even when we're deeply hurt, because he saves us to the uttermost because of his steadfast love. Betrayal is common to everybody. It was common with Jesus. He knows how difficult it is. Knowing in advance that betrayal is hard doesn't make it better, but one of the things we can do when we experience hurt at the hands of others is to go to Psalm 109. And let that model for our hearts what it looks like to seek God's justice and know that all things will be made right in him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your grace in Christ. We thank you for the joy it is to know you by faith. As Christians, Lord, we are grateful that you make intervention. God, I would pray that every person in this room today would would know in their hearts that they are saved by faith in you. And that there would not be anyone here today who is going to decide to bear their sin themselves. And God, I pray for all of us to the degree that we have experienced betrayal and hurt and wounding and many of those things we carry. I pray, Lord, that you would give us the joy of being able to hand that over to you and say, Lord, you know how bad we were harmed. Will you make this right and allow me to rest in you? God, we thank you for your love and your grace in Jesus, and we pray that you would make us more like him every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand up with us as we close with a song?